Many of the improvements in oil and petrol have been made possible by more sophisticated refining of the crude oil. Today, almost everything a refinery produces can be used by the car industry. Besides petrol and oil, it provides the chemicals which are the basis of plastics, paints and synthetic rubbers, and even the bitumen that the roads are made of. Gasoline. Liquid power to run millions of automobiles everywhere. Yet, how many know what happens to the gas after it is poured into the gas tanks? Or realize the care that motor car engineers have taken to give each drop an equal chance to do its duty? Gasoline is powerful, but each drop can give a 100% account of himself only when he finds the most efficiently designed gasoline system to help him along his journey. For a successful life, every drop of gasoline depends entirely upon what happens to him after he gets in the swim. First, the fuel has to be mixed with air. The air comes in through the large air filter on top of the engine, and it's mixed with the fuel inside the carburetor. It's easiest to see the uh, principle of the carburetor with this model. We've uh, used a vacuum cleaner to represent the engine because it's sucking in air all the time. It simply sucks the fuel up and mix up this little tube and mixes it with the air in here. Here we're going to use red ink instead of uh, petrol so that you can see it more clearly. Petrol by itself isn't explosive. Only the mixture of petrol vapour and oxygen from the air. You can see the petrol being sucked in, looking down a real carburetor. Unfortunately, real engines need different concentrations of fuel for different conditions, starting, idling, accelerating, etc. That's why the 1902 Woolsey had the mixture lever on the steering wheel. Modern carburetors make all these adjustments automatically, but this is why they're so fiendishly complicated. Today, a completely different system, fuel injection, is becoming more common. It's basically very simple. There's just a row of electric valves, one for each cylinder, that squirt a bit of petrol into each inlet. The precise length of time the valve opens, controlled by a computer, varies the amount of fuel injected very accurately. Once the fuel and air has been sucked into the cylinder and squashed up, it's ignited. The spark's created by a high voltage jumping across a gap in the spark plug. The high voltage itself is created by the coil connected to the battery. Engines don't like getting wet because water provides an easier path for the electricity than jumping across the gap, which I think I can show you. Put the spark out. Fortunately, though, you can often get the spark back again simply with a water-repelling oil. Although the ignition should be started by the spark, petrol's a complicated mixture of chemicals, some of which are quite unstable. These can ignite spontaneously under heat and pressure, causing a sort of uneven explosion called detonation or knock. As engines have become more powerful over the years, knock has become more of a problem. It can be overcome either by damping the unstable compounds with lead additives or in lead-free petrol by refining the unstable compounds out. The other option, used in diesel engines, is to refine the fuel less and to compress it more. The more the fuel squashed up in the cylinder, the hotter it gets. It can get so hot that it ignites spontaneously without any spark. We've blocked the bottom of this cylinder up completely and uh, cut a hole in it. Um, and if I put a bit of fuel in the side here and bash the piston down with a hammer, it should ignite. If I blow out the burnt gases, there may be enough fuel left to make it work a second time.
It was a Victorian cigar lighter working on this principle that inspired Rudolf Diesel to design his first engine in the 1890s. Diesel believed that more compression would make his engine much more efficient. Mm. A vision I have of a better future. Machines will free mankind from slavery of work. The higher compression made the engine more dangerous, and a prototype nearly killed him. What? Nearly killed me! By 1895, though, Diesel had a design which ran on cheap fuel and was twice as efficient as any other engine of its time. Diesel became a millionaire from his invention, but invested very badly, quickly getting heavily into debt and decided he couldn't carry on. Ah, my God! I cannot pay this! In May 1913, he set off on a night ferry to Britain. I go. Goodbye. He was never seen again. Today, the diesel engine has been greatly improved and it's now fitted in many cars. This contraption, which Rex and I built for a TV series a few years ago, is diesel powered. The engine, from a Volkswagen Golf car, hardly looks any different from a petrol one. However, as diesel originally thought, the higher compression does make the engine more efficient and do more miles to the gallon. Here, as well as driving the vehicle, the engine's also powering the hydraulic lift. The most dramatic change to both diesel and petrol engines in the last 10 years has been the addition of sophisticated electronics. This modern car engine, compared to the earlier ones, is horrendously complicated. For example, there's two computers on board. One controls the electronic fuel injection, another one controls the cruise control. Even though the engine is much more complicated, this makes the most of every drop of fuel and gives greater fuel economy and power. Although the complex electronics would be impossible to repair by the roadside, I've driven 80,000 miles in it, and even with my poor maintenance, it's never even failed once. The engine's improved enormously since 1900. It starts at a flick of a switch. It's incredibly powerful. And it's really very reliable. But it's still far from perfect. Despite its power, it's really very wasteful. Four-fifths of the energy released by the petrol is simply lost as heat through the radiator and the exhaust. And the exhaust gases themselves pose even worse problems. There's an awful lot of them. The average car releases four times its own weight in exhaust gases during its life. And it's all pretty horrid stuff. This wasn't such a problem when there weren't so many cars around. If we are to realize in full the motor car's vast potential for good, we must use it and care for it wisely. The motor car has been the key to open new horizons, not for the few, but for all. And all of us share in the responsibility of safeguarding the benefits it has brought. If we plan for the future, if we look ahead to clear all obstacles and roadblocks, if we recognize the importance of this great individual freedom of movement, the motor car will be the key to our ever-widening horizons of tomorrow.
to sing about America, you'd better make sure you have the breath to sing with. We've been fighting air pollution, but it's time to fight harder. Help us. It's a beautiful country. Let's not get all choked up about it. In an attempt to clean up the exhaust gases, catalytic converters are gradually becoming compulsory all over the world. Oh, oh, Dad! Dad, Dad, it smells all funny! Dad, Dad, stop! Recent reports from America suggest in practice catalysts may only remove about 30% of the poisonous gases because the engine needs careful maintenance for them to work properly. Don't worry, Sir Troll, with the catalytic oil, mm. very common these days. I'll just yes. adjust this screw and then that'll be all right. Even when they do work perfectly, they only convert the gases to carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas. It's getting awfully hot, dear. Oh, oil, Dad! <laughs> Nothing for it. Have to go electric. It's the only way to be really green. Electric cars aren't perfect either. The electricity to charge their batteries just transfers a lot of the pollution to the power stations. I don't think there's any such thing as a completely green car. The engine's really a victim of its own success. Despite its disgusting exhaust, it's such a reliable and potent source of power, it's made the car and all sorts of other machines completely indispensable. It's so central to our modern way of life that there's almost something rather religious about it. 